Pharma Pakistan, as well as SOGP, the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Pakistan. My name is Halima Yasmin. I am Secretary General of the SOGP. The mission and vision of SOGP is to have uh, awareness about women's health and uh, to achieve women's health to the highest standard. So today in this webinar, we have invited uh, university students to talk about their menstrual health, reproductive health related issues, and issues related to uh, urinary tract infections. These issues are usually not discussed by these young women, and they think that they are taboos or myths about it so that they don't discuss it openly. So this webinar will definitely benefit all these students. I'm glad and I really like to know that there are so many university students linked up today for this webinar. If they can uh, write in the chat box which university are they linking from, where are they joining from, it would be really good to know. So uh, we have a very esteemed speaker for today's session, Professor Shamsar Rizwan. Professor Shamsar Rizwan is a very senior member of Society of Ops and Gaini Pakistan. She is a PhD in public health. Madam is an FRCOG from UK. She is a reviewer of the Journal of SOGP, and she participates in all academic activities of society very actively. We are pleased and honored to have her today with us. I'm also glad to announce that the uh, hosts or the moderators for today's session would be the three young women from three universities, one from LAMS, one from Aga Khan University Hospital, and one from IBA. So my first host for today's session is Bisma Mehdi. Bisma is a student at LAMS University, BAS 2022. She is uh, from Accounting and Finance Department. So over to you, Bisma Mehdi, to ask questions from Professor Rizwan. OK, thank you so much for that warm introduction. Let's jump right in. Uh, Dr. Shamsa, could you please elaborate a bit about the significance of the menstrual cycle? Um, thank you very much for giving me this, this opportunity to talk to young people. Um, the good thing that's happening globally is that people are more and more interested in health tracking. But when you talk of health tracking of women, I think the vital sign of that is a menstrual cycle. Because just like blood pressure and pulse and respiratory rate that we take as vital signs, for reproductive health, menstrual cycle is the vital sign. If there is any abnormality in the, in the menstrual cycle, that actually tells a lot about the health and well-being of young people. Typically, a, a girl starts menstruating at the age of 11 to 14 years. And I think it is very important for us to really observe our cycles. Why do we need to do that is because uh, one is to prevent accidents, right? So uh, you need to understand your own unique pattern because everybody doesn't have the same cycle. Other than that, also understanding and managing mood because we all know that you know menstrual cycle is also strongly related with the mood changes that happen. But the most important part of it is that we will detect problems or issues uh, that that bigger issues that are there and the only symptom would be an irregular uh, irregularity in the menstrual cycle yeah it's definitely an interesting topic considering how even when i was younger a lot of girls actually didn't know what the, what a cycle was until they had it and that's a very alarming fact that unfortunately it's too prevalent in our country so moving on what would constitute a cycle irregularity or an anomaly and yeah, sure. sorry. And just for why that, is it important to consult your gynecologist based on that? Yeah. For that, I think it's very important to really understand what a normal cycle is. Uh, many time, many a times, girls would come with the normal cycle, just having this uh, this thing in their mind that oh, there is some abnormality if I'm having my cycle not exactly on the same date. So that's pro probably a problem. It isn't. So if the cycle length is shorter than 21 days, that's that's concerning. You definitely should see your um, gynecologist or doctor uh, to understand what the problem may be underlying. Uh, also, um, it's important to note what is the flow of the blood if it is too heavy, if somebody is um, you know, passing clots. So that is something that is concerning. If the duration of the bleeding 
you know, normally it's from five to seven days, but it is like 10 days, 15 days, that, that is again alarming. If the cycle length is also, it's two months or three months, the person who has been menstruating previously is not menstruating, uh, that again is something that that is considered as an abnormality or irregularity, and we really need to then see uh, a doctor. Exactly. What would you say are also some of the highest risk factors as well? Like because a lot of questions that I like for, for for example I hear the most like how what makes you very likely towards towards the scenario? Well, there are certain things that are genetic. There are certain things that are anatomical. Uh, or there are certain pathological problems that can happen to a certain person. But um, the fact is that, you know, uh, if a person has a healthy lifestyle and you eat healthy, you exercise, there are lesser chances of having problems with the menstruation. So you would say that is the main form of treatment as such? Treatment of menstrual irregularity, you know, um, yeah. Why I, I, it is really important to talk about menstrual irregularities is that many a times it's the hidden disease that is actually the symptom is the irregularity in the periods, which may, somebody may not take it seriously, mm -hmm. but the symptom of the disease that is actually causing that problem. For example, there can be a tumor lying in your abdomen that is causing heavy menstrual bleeding. There, there is a tumor lying in your brain, which may be causing the cessation of menstruation. There may be uh, some other problem or health risk. If you do not treat it right at the time when the symptom appears, there can be long-term consequences. There can be um, more severe morbidity, morbidities. So that is why it is very important to not to take any irregularity in the cycle uh, lightly. One has to talk to the doctor. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Shamsa. I really hope a lot of people are learning a lot about this. I'm going to hand it over to Mahin Zakaria. She is an MBBS student at Aar Khan University, class of 2024. And she's going to be discussing a very important topic that is unfortunately, again, not talked about in Pakistan, PCOS. So Mahin, over to you. Mind your mute, I think. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you, Bismar, for that insightful discussion on menstrual irregularities. Uh, very important topic. But now we're going to move on to an equally important uh, disorder that is polycystic ovarian syndrome, commonly known as PCOS. Uh, it is the most common hormonal disorder that's experienced by women of reproductive age. So, Dr. Zephyr, the first question I have for you today is, why do women get PCOS and is it genetic in nature? Yeah, so, I mean, um, a lot of girls are now getting polycystic ovarian uh, disease and a lot of people, girls come with this concern also. So, in my clinic, almost daily, there is one or two people who come with this problem. So, I think it's really important for us to know uh, how does it develop. So, yes, there is a genetic component to it, but that, that does not mean that all cases of polycystic ovaries are genetically linked. There are some that are genetically linked. Some can be due to environmental factors, like we've just talked about the um, healthy lifestyle. So if, if this lifestyle, the diet, the exercise is not there, that can be the reason for that as well. So um, there can be certain hormonal disturbances, hormonal problems, like for example, there is uh, if there is an insulin resistance that leads to production of insulin and that is the one which then causes an increase in the production of a hormone, the androgens, which are the male hormones that are responsible for most of the problems that we have in polycystic ovaries. So yes, they're, they're, it is multifactorial. And is obesity linked to uh, PCOS? Yes. Um, obesity, there are many other symptoms that are other than obesity. Um, weight gain is one of the most important ones, but also menstrual irregularity. We were just talking about menstrual irregularity. So one of the symptoms that young girls come to me with is that they fail to have periods for two months, three months, or um, the scanty periods are there. So that could be one of the signs of polycystic ovarian disease. In addition to that, there can be thinning of the hair. There can be abnormal hair on the body. 
for example, on the chin, on the breast. So uh, there can be also hyperpigmentation, dark discoloration of the skin. So all of these symptoms can be there with polycystic ovaries. And uh, we really need to uh, you know, uh, consult a doctor and think about healthy lifestyles. So one of the questions I was going to ask you was if weight gain and hyperpigmentation are commonly seen in this condition and you answered that already, but if you have anything more to add, please do so. Yeah, I mean, it's important for us to re realize that uh, polycystic ovarian uh, disease is, is basically because of increased production of male hormones. Now, don't worry because many people, oh, I'm a female, why would I have? male hormones so every woman has little amount of male hormones already there but then uh, when that becomes excessive then the all of these symptoms appear and the main uh, that is the main problem that that leads to all the changes that are happening the hyperpigmentation the uh, hair loss and and everything so um, the first important thing is to really uh, have a good lifestyle and if that is not, I mean, you try to lose weight and for losing weight, we all understand that it's important to cut down on your diet and increase your exercise, right? Thank you. Um, so the next question I have is a lot of women remain unaware of the fact that they have PCOS. They might think it's something else. Can you tell us what's the typical age of onset? So if women are seeing these symptoms, they can be aware and approach a medical professional. Yeah, so um, this can happen at any time. It can start with menop when you have your first menstrual period. It can start with that. But most of the people have polycystic symptoms at the age of 20 or 30 years. So the main symptoms will be uh, menstrual irregularity and the ones that I've already told you. But also, if somebody uh, gets married and is there is um, difficulty in conceiving, that could be the only the first symptom. So, uh, and, and um, it is important for us to realize that polycystic ovarian disease in addition to causing these problems where there can be problems with the fertility, problems with the cycle, problems with the appearance, acne, all of those things, there are also long-term problems that are associated with polycystic ovarian disease. And those long-term, for example, they, there is uh, a risk of ovarian cancers, there is a risk of uh, diabetes later in life. So, um, at the right time, if the treatment is started and if the hormone levels are brought down, that can really help the woman. Yeah, so it's very important to manage it as soon as um, you figure out that you have PCOS. So another obviously related question is, can we treat it um, in addition to managing it? Can we treat it and is there a long-term treatment available that yeah. uh, we can make use of? And I think yeah, and I think there are two parts of the treatment, uh, essentially, with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, one is psychological, and I really give it um, importance because, as you can understand, if a person is overweight, has a lot of acne, has hair on the face, that leads to a lot of psychological issues, stress, and, and we really need to manage that. Um, and, and by helping them understand the disease, by helping them reducing and bringing all those things to normal. That is one thing. And the second thing is, of course, treatment, which will be adjusted according to what uh, part of the life are they in, what, what is the actual symptom that is causing the problem. For example, if somebody has a menstrual irregularity, that has to be treated. If somebody has subfertility, is in, in able, unable to conceive, so we can help them with that. But the mainstay of the treatment would be to bring the hormone levels, the androgen levels down by giving hormones. So um, again, you know, there is a myth and uh, many of the mothers may also be listening. Um, they're very much concerned about, oh, don't give hormones to our child. They might uh, affect the future fertility. That's not true, actually. Uh, hormones are treatment for this particular problem and these are very very safe there is no problem in using hormones nowadays you know um, people who uh, young girls who want to delay uh, conception after marriage they are using contraceptive pills with, without any side effects so i would say that um, hormonal treatment would reduce the levels 
the hormones that can reduce the androgen levels would be really useful. Reiterating, it would be important to focus on lifestyle modifications like diet control, um, exercising, then it would be targeted therapy for the problems that they are experiencing, whether it is menstrual irregularities or infertility. But in addition to that, hormone therapy would be, you'd say, necessary for managing the androgen, um, the excess that women are exactly. experiencing in this condition. Absolutely correct. Yeah. Thank you so much for all of that information. I hope it helps our audience. We're now going to move on to our last topic for the day, for which I'll be handing over the floor to Javeria Asif. Javeria Asif is a final year student at IBA, and she's studying mathematics and economics over there. Over to you, Javeria. Thank you, Mayin, for the warm introduction. Uh, hello, Dr. Shamsa. It's a delight to uh, have you here today. And uh, we have already discussed very important issues, but uh, I think it's time that we address uh, urinary tract infections. Uh, as we understand, they are very prevalent, uh, especially amongst women of all these groups. Um, so with that, I will proceed to my uh, first question, which is, uh, what is UTI and uh, why is it so prevalent among women? So urinary tract infection, UTI, is basically an infection of the urinary tract. It's simple. So what is the urinary tract? It's uh, actually the urethra, which is visible. And then there is uh, the bladder, urinary bladder, the ureters, and kidney. So this all makes it into a urinary tract system. And infection anywhere at these six areas would be called urinary tract infection. So why women get it more frequently as compared to men is because of the fact that the length of the urethra is very small. And, and uh, the infection uh, bacteria can simply get in and, and cause that infection. Right. Um, so uh, I think that uh, it is a very common reality, especially in Pakistan, that uh, most of us are not even aware of uh, UTIs. Right, uh, even like educated women are not really aware of it. So, um, with regards to that, my second question to you is how can uh, women uh, prevent UTI? So, um, the, again, it's, it's a very these are simple things, and I think um, these are important for us to know. Everyone knows that drinking eight to ten glasses of water will improve our skin, but you know, uh, drinking eight to ten glasses of water will also prevent us from getting urinary tract infections, right? So that is one. The other thing is that um, when we are cleaning ourselves after passing urine, it's important not to touch from behind to front because then you may be bringing organisms from the stool to the urinary tract. That has to be avoided, right? So hygiene is really, really important in this case. Another important thing is that uh, when when we are uh, when we have help to pass urine, we should go and pass and frequently every two to three hours a woman should pass urine because whenever you are holding urine, it, it, it stays there for a longer period of time. There are more chances of it getting infected. So it would be a very good habit if every three hours you go to the washroom and pass urine. That would be really help you Right. Uh, thank you, doctor. I think it's very important that we keep this in mind because uh, I think it often happens and I've like heard people also talk about this and you know when we, most girls are experiencing periods, for example, it's they consider it may, uh, an inconvenience to, you know, go to the washroom and every two, three hours they're like, I'd rather hold it, you know, when I really have yeah. to go. So, yeah, I think that I would like to Say one thing here that you know many times it's about menstrual hygiene as well that I really want to emphasize on. Um, many of the people I've heard saying that when you are having periods, you should not clean yourself with water. I've heard people saying you should not take a bath, and that really yeah. makes me wonder because this is the time when you really need to be very very clean because blood is a good culture medium for infection. So if you do not clean yourself regularly, you do not use water. And you know, take care of your hygiene, more chances that you will get your nature infections and other infections as well. Right. 
So I have the women with us today uh, make note of all this. Um, with that, I will ask you my third question. So what are the most common symptoms of a UTI? Well, uh, the first symptom that a person would have is that there will be a frequency of uh, urination. So uh, what happens is the person feels like going to the washroom, passes urine, comes back, and again, there is an urge to pass urine. So this is way different from what you feel normally. There can also be burning, a lot of burning. This can also sometimes happen if you're not drinking enough water, but this burning is a little more than that. Then also, when you have passed urine, there will be extreme pain in some cases. So this is quite a sharp pain that a person might experience. So these are generally the symptoms. Sometimes there can be blood in the urine as well. So uh, one, one should take note of these symptoms. The urine may become cloudy also. An infection. Right. Okay, so, um, Doctor, you think that uh, UTI. Sorry, Javeria, I can't hear you. Uh, may like go away on its own, like if we do preventive measures such as drinking water. So, I mean, there's another misconception that I see a lot of people now using cranberry and other things, uh, some home remedies, and they are just trying so that the urinary tract infection goes away. So, you see, there is a bacteria which is lying there in your urinary tract. Maybe it likes cranberry juice, but it won't go away. It will stay there, it will flourish. And the only treatment, if there is a urinary Infection. First, you have to confirm whether there is a urinary tract infection. It's a test that can be done on the urine. And if there is an infection, it has to be treated with antibiotics. And the more you delay, uh, the more it spreads. And if it goes to the kidneys, and then that can become complicated. It's important to identify the symptom, uh, test yourself, and then uh, get the treatment, antibiotic treatment. That is important. Can you, um, right. Uh, sorry, doctor, I think there was some a glitch at the end of the internet. Um, thank you. I would like to ask you my last question now uh, in relation to all of this. So how is UTI treated and what is the role of uh, originator antibiotics in uh, correct doses? So uh, I think that's a very important point you uh, asked me about. Um, Self-medication, I would say no, no. So a lot of people are now Googling and whatever is happening written there, they can just follow that. And that actually causes a lot of problems because um, when you are not using the right medication for the, for the right thing, um, that medication with time will be useless to you. So it will not work for your problems. So it is important that you use original high quality medications. That's very important. Sometimes, you know, um, I think this uh, should be considered by the health professionals as well that when they're prescribing, they should be giving high quality and original drugs. But uh, I think from the demand side, that is from your side, um, when, you, when you go to the doctor, you want to make sure that this is done. And also, it's important to be compassionate to yourself. Why harm yourself? You know, by self-medication, you will be harming yourself. You will be taking doses way above what is needed. Right? You will be taking medication that's absolutely not necessary. Or maybe preparation, a simple preparation might help, and you may be taking a very um, you know, complicated one. So it's better always to uh, be completely useful. Go to a consultant doctor to help you in, in deciding what to medicate. Right. Thank you, doctor. I think it's uh, it's also we should note that you know in a country like Pakistan, there is obviously a huge lack of awareness as well, and then uh, we also have a lot of peer pressure and social pressure where we usually you know come under what our elders are usually telling us, and we usually just follow that. So uh, hopefully the trend changes. Um, so thank you, doctor. That that was all from my side today. That was quite insightful. And now I would like to hand the show back over to Dr.
our SOG, from SOG. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the issue so well. And uh, Professor Shamta for answering the query so well. I think uh, these were really relevant to women health. And uh, we should bring in the concept of uh, well women clinics as well. So mm -hmm. I think engaging our youth into discussions like this will definitely go a long way. And they really uh, brought in very, very frequently asked questions in your and my clinic and a clinic of every consultant and provider who deals with uh, women health. Uh, a lot of youth and their moms, they come with all these issues and they are so easily treatable. And uh, at the same time, when we are talking about pharmacological measures, we definitely should talk about non-pharmacological uh, attitudes towards our treatment, that is healthy lifestyle. If we eat healthy, we live a healthy lifestyle, we, we do regular exercise, that, that is also, I think, to be stressed on our side, especially you and me. Uh, when we are talking about a professional forum. Uh, I must say that Bayer is, uh, has really done a good job in raising awareness and engaging youth, which is very, very important resource when it comes to health education. We cannot just go on on our own. I think engaging these women and empowering these young women would definitely uh, go a long way. Uh, thank you, SOGP. Thank you, Professor Shamsa. Thank you, all thank you. those young, wonderful moderators. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.